I don't love him enough. I think that's kind of the, the reflection. This is a really bracing examination of conscience. This gospel, it, 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 it's, Jesus is not coming up with anything new either. That's oftentimes we think, oh, wow, he's coming up with something remarkable. No, he's just quoting from Deuteronomy and from Leviticus. He's summarizing the law and getting right to the heart of what the law is really about. All the other ceremonial laws, all of the other disciplinary laws, they all get down to this. It's about love of God. Do I love God more than anything else? Do I love him more than my own ideas? Do I love him more than my own projects, more than my own uh, preoccupations? Will I put him first above all other things? And you're like, oh, why do I have to do all that other stuff? You know, that was the whole purpose. It was training the people to put God's preferences over theirs. Why does it matter what food I eat? I don't know, ask God, <laughs> right? You're learning to develop divine preferences, right? So that was the purpose of the old law. It was to train us in righteousness, but there's a problem, right? It didn't give the power to carry it out. It was external observance only, and we needed something else. You're not far from the kingdom of God, but wait, wow, if you just did this, it'd be pretty remarkable, right? To love God with all your heart, all your soul, all your strength, all your mind, and to love your neighbors yourself. Like, that sounds like a pretty good life, right? What more do I need? Didn't we just hear this a couple weeks ago? The rich young man. It's like, I'm doing all this stuff. What else is, what's missing? There is something else. Because it's not just about living a good life. Right? Because it was about living a good life, right? That, a lot of people live a good life. Is that really what holiness is? No, holiness is Jesus, right? You're not far from the kingdom of God, but what you need is you need, and you need to give your whole life to him. Sell what you have, give it to the poor, and come follow me, and you'll have treasure in your heaven, right? And that's the reality, is that what's missing is the relationship with the Lord Jesus. So we have to realize that this God that we were trained to love, the God of Israel, is now here in the flesh, Jesus Christ. And we need to give him that kind of love and that kind of obedience, that kind of submission of will. That's a really tough sell. And some people are like, no, nah, I don't want that. I want to walk away, right? That's why nobody dared ask me any questions. Like, well, what, what could be the kingdom in addition to that? They're scared to know. But indeed, he reveals where the king is, there is the kingdom. Amen? So... This is a good examination of conscience. It's actually been something we've been working on as a parish over the last couple of years. We've been working on our clarity of what we're about. And we actually talked about three core virtues, three core values that we really try and live ourselves. And they're based on these two things. First is docility to the truth. Do I love God with my whole mind? This is really important. So docility to the truth, zeal for the Lord. Do I love God with all my heart? And then thirdly, genuine love for every person we encounter. So do I love my neighbors myself? So firstly, do I believe that God's teaching is good? And I've noticed this. This is really something, isn't it? In our world today, they're like, I'm Catholic, but I don't agree with the church on that. You ever heard that before? Right, maybe you've said those words, right? The fact of the matter is we have to say that's not loving God with our whole mind. There are many teachings of the church that are difficult. But the fact is, if I don't understand them, I have to start with the principle of saying, I believe God is good. And he, if he's good, then his laws are good. Amen? Even if I don't understand them, there must be a reason for it, and I should try and find it. Do I, in fact, try and understand God's law? Do I actually make the study of God's law my aim in life? This is a good examination of conscience to recognize, do I really make God the object of my thoughts every day? It, do I order my life around him, and do I try and understand him more? We can never understand all of it, but do I try? Do I actually, and the things I don't understand, do I really doggedly pursue them? You know, when I was a kid, when I was a teenager, like, I couldn't bear people in my class who were like, ah, eh, who cares? I'm like, oh, it absolutely matters! <laughs> Maybe that was weird. I was wired differently, right? But the thing is, I realized it was a gift. God planted that bug in my brain that said, I'm not happy with a pat answer being like, because I said so. Who here hated that answer? Okay, right? And haven't we hated that answer when it comes from our government? Just trust me, because I said so. Guess what? That's not a convincing argument. It isn't. And God doesn't ask us to believe something just because he said so. That's how a lot of people approach faith. Oh, faith is just believing, and I don't have a reason. That's not faith. That's being dumb. <laughs> right? That's just being a sheep and following wherever. And we are sheep, right? But the fact of the matter is, is that there's a good sense and a bad sense. A good sense of being a child who's dependent upon God for everything is one thing. It's another to not care about the truth. 
We need to pursue it. We need to really study it. That's why we have theology. That's why we have philosophy. We can, in fact, know a lot. And there's a lot of teachings of the church right now that the world doesn't like. Doesn't like the church's teaching on abortion. Doesn't like the church's teaching on euthanasia or on contraception. Many Catholics even don't like that teaching. But it's actually the root cause of all of our problems right now. IVF, which is a big one right now. A lot of people are like, what's the problem with IVF? Like, the problem is, is we don't understand it. A lot of people are like, what's the church? The church is pro-life. Why don't we like babies? Of course we love babies. Every child, no matter how they're conceived, right? We love every child because every child is a gift of God. But the method in which a child is conceived in IVF is really wicked. Most people don't know how it works. The fact is, is that you separate love and life to create a child outside of the womb. There's several sins involved in that to get there, right? But then secondly, once you actually create a child, you're not just creating one child, they create many children. You can't control how many you create. And then they screen for the best ones and they throw away the rest or put them in a freezer or experiment on them. Friends, we don't realize this. We have like over half a million children in freezers right now. That's the IVF industry. Children are being bought and sold. It's creating a new industry of surrogacy. It's horrendous. But you see, most people, they just think, oh, well, uh, you want a baby, you, you make it happen, right? But the fact of the matter is, friends, you can't do anything to get a good end. Having a child is a beautiful thing, it's a wonderful thing, but you can't do anything you want to get one. Amen? I mean, in fact, that's the church's teaching. The fact is, do I love the church's teaching? Do I actually submit myself to God to say, I will, in fact, do only good and not evil? Even if I want something good, I can't do evil so that good can result. Does that make sense? The church's teaching makes sense, but sometimes it takes a while to, to, to parse it out. And, we're, and I, I know this, the fact is that we, we, we definitely have family members and friends who are conceived in IVF. You are not evil. I want you to hear that. You are a gift of God, no matter how you came into existence, whether you were the product of, of a loving two-parent household that was married in the church, whether you were born out of wedlock, it doesn't matter. You are here and God loves you. But that doesn't mean we can keep on doing evil in the world. We need to convert our hearts. Amen? But this is the good news of the gospel. No matter where you came from, no matter your origins, you are called to be holy. And you don't have control over how you came into existence. But you do have control over what you do now. Amen? So do, will we love the Lord with our whole mind? Will we, in fact, submit to the truth of Jesus Christ, even when it's not our preference or we don't understand it? docility to the truth, right? But then zeal for the Lord. Do I love him with my whole heart? Does he consume my days? You have to ask the question, like, when you say, oh, I love God, do you think about him all the time? Oh, yeah, I think about God all the time. Are you restless whenever you're not in church? <laughs> all right, I want you to just remember this. How many of you have ever been, like, head over heels in love before? How many of you still head over heels in love right now? Okay, awesome. Good boy, all right? <laughs> But the fact is, is that, look, look, like, when you're not around them, what are you thinking about? When can I see them again? Right? When you're Twitter-pated, okay, that's all you can think about. When will I see them again? When will I hear their voice again? Do we have that attitude with God? When is the next time I can go to the church and go to adoration? When is the next time I get to go to Mass? When is the next time I get to pray? When is the next time I get to steal away and read the Word of God? When is the next time I get to pray my rosary? Are we that consumed with it? If not, we don't love Him yet with all of our heart. And I have to say, friends, I'm not condemning anybody because I'm there too. Some days I'm more there than others. But this is a good examination of conscience. Sometimes people are like, oh, I don't need to go to confession. It's like, friends, uh, do you love God with everything? If not, then you're not fulfilling the law. You got something to confess. I, I, I oftentimes I think, uh, this, it's remarkable. I, I, I was last time you had a confession. Oh, maybe like 5, 10, 16 years. Uh, uh, I, I guess I said a few bad words, you know, sometimes. Yeah, I got angry a couple times. That's it. <laughs> 16 years! <laughs> This is a totally fictitious example, right? But the fact is, is that, like, we have to just think, right? If we're barely going to confession and we're thinking, ah, I don't really need to go, do we really live the law? Do we really love God with all of our heart, with all of our mind, with all of our strength? Is every activity in relation to God, do you only choose the work that you have because God wants it? Do you only choose a spouse because God put you together? Do you only choose particular activities because they glorify God? All the time? Every single day? Give me a break. Because I know I don't do that. 
I do it more than I used to, but I'm not there yet. So these goals, these commandments, they are meant to challenge us and they're meant to make us despair. They're meant to call us higher, but also to realize no matter what you do yourself, you can't do this by yourself. And so what do you need to do then? You need to submit to the Lord Jesus. And if you do, and if you give your heart to him, you say, Lord, I just, I want to do this, but I'm so weak. I can't do it. He's going to say, now we're in the right spot, son. Now, daughter, I'll help you. Pray, come Holy Spirit, and I'll help you. Come Holy Spirit. Yes. Because, friends, we're called to perfection. And, it's, and if you were like me, you tried to be a perfectionist, and that's different from perfection, right? Being a perfectionist is different, right? And it's a frustrating, exhausting life. I know, I've lived it for most of my life. <laughs> it's a frustrating, exhausting life, chasing after your own version of perfection. And then you're pretty unmerciful toward other people too, right? But if we literally live the perfection of Jesus, it's a perfection in love. And it's a submission completely to him to say, I cannot do this on my own, but with God, all things are possible. This is a really good reminder to us as we're here in this month of November. We're reminded as we just celebrated All Saints and All Souls Day, we're reminded that the saints are the ones who do this. And, and uh, the saints are not all alike. They're very different. They're different people. They have different walks of life, different life experiences, but they all have something in common, and that's they all gave their whole self to Jesus. That's what keeps them in common, is that no matter if they were young or old, men or women, married or not, whether they had great intellects or they were uneducated and couldn't even read, all of them gave everything to Jesus until the end. Some started late. Some started really early. So no matter where you are, if you're like, wow, I've wasted all my life, you have today. Amen? Give everything, your whole heart, your whole mind, your whole soul to him, and he will make up the difference. That's the beauty of grace, isn't it? It's remarkable, isn't it? You pour a little bit of water over somebody in the power of the Holy Spirit and it changes their whole being. They become a new creature. Take ordinary bread and wine. The power of the Holy Spirit comes upon it and it becomes the source of life, the creator of the universe. <gasps> if that can happen here, it's meant to show you that no matter where you've been and or what you've done, if you will give it to God, he can make it whole. He can give it new life. Do not remain in the shadow of death anymore. Do not remain with your excuses anymore. Do not be like, oh, that's impossible, Father. Of course it is. That's why you need grace. So quit being so proud and relying on yourself and rely on him. And it's going to be great. St. Therese, right? She's like, I'm not John of the Cross. I'm not Teresa of Avila. I'm not one of the giants. I can't soar to the heights. I'm a little bird with broken wings. I need to be a little bird in the hands of my God. And what she discovered was the little way, which is not infantile. It's actually the truth of the gospel. Once you realize your littleness and your nothingness, God will exalt you to the highest heavens. But as long as you think you're big and you're somebody, you're going to be crashed down to the earth. And at the end of your life, it's going to be a really unpleasant conversation with God. But if we're humble in this life, then we will hear those beautiful words at the end of our life, well done, good and faithful servant. Come enter your master's joy. Come Holy Spirit.